Hi, I'm Scott Furkin, Executive Director of the Louisville Bar Association. And I'm pleased to welcome you to another edition of the LBA Speaks, a CLE program produced in partnership with Jim Ray Consulting Services, where we sit down with a local attorney, LBA member, to talk about their area of practice. Today our guest is Holly Houston, a local attorney and LBA member who has been a sole practitioner and a family court lawyer since 1997. She has appeared in proceedings relating to divorce, custody, child support, domestic violence, dependency, neglect and abuse, adoption, guardianship, non-support, and name change proceedings for clients. And she also represents criminal defendants and small business clients. Uh, Holly has a degree in journalism from the University of Kentucky, and she earned her Juris Doctor from the Brandeis School of Law at the University of Louisville. She's co-founder and co-director of Greater Louisville Outstanding Women, a networking, mentoring, business skill building group for businesswomen, and she also launched a regional meetup of businesswomen and female leaders in Kentucky and Cincinnati. Holly, thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Scott. You know, um, the American Psychological Association reports that in Western cultures, 90% of people marry by age 50, but in the U.S., 40 to 50% of the married couples divorce, and the divorce rate's even higher for marriages, uh, for subsequent marriages. So um, that makes good work for, for family law, yes, but indeed. it also is a complex area of the law that uh, takes a special skill set. I wanted to ask you, kind of to get a little bit of a historical perspective, we know that at one time, in order to get divorced, a party had to allege and prove grounds like adultery or cruelty or a desertion for a specified period of time. Now we have so-called no-fault divorce. Can you kind of distinguish for us how the advent of no-fault no divorce changed the legal lands landscape with respect to divorce? I think if anybody was around in the 80s and saw the movie Kramer versus Kramer with Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman, I know I saw it as a child and um, it was incredibly adversarial as was War of the Roses. I think at some point um, the powers that be decided to take as much of that um, adversarialness that they could out of the process and decide that divorce should be for any reason or for no reason at all. I think it's difficult for some people to it, still comprehend that, especially with adultery. But people always seem to want to have um, more relief, I think, and sort of avenge that in, in divorce proceedings. And when they learn that it really is no fault, and it, it's, it, takes, um, it, it takes their mind uh, a little a little bit to catch up with that, I think, let alone the emotional part. I understand. And, and I also understand that in addition to being um, knowledgeable in the law, when you're advising um, clients in dissolution of marriage proceedings, you also have to be somewhat of a, of a personal counselor, do you not? Well, I mean, you here's, here's <laughs> the best tip that I can give anybody that would want to practice family law. You have to have really solid boundaries um, because it is an emotional experience. Uh, even with short marriages, because you're talking about money and you're talking about kids. And if you want to push people's buttons, talk to them about money and kids. And, it, and it's different than criminal because there you're talking about, you know, the, the removal of someone's liberty, the deprivation of liberty. But boy, is that family law, it, it, it really creates anxiety for clients. And you have to have um, some ability to manage that, which we call client control. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't do that, there there will be problems because they will take all of your time and energy, and you have to be able to to um, you have to be able to kind of squeeze that and rein that in a little bit. I understand. I have heard it said that in um, criminal court we see bad people at their best, and in family law we see good people at their worst. Would, well, would you I'm agree not with sure that? that we see bad people at their best in criminal court. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, Scott. Okay. But absolutely and, and what's fascinating is I will see clients after the fact out in public maybe at, at a coffee shop at a social gathering they're unrecognizable sometimes because that the tension and um, you know just the strife it, divorce is not easy and custody is not easy and the adversarial it, it's still an adversarial approach although I believe that we're working toward and I hope what happens is, is that that decreases 
over the years because I, I don't think that's in the best interest of families because when clients leave, I don't see them again, they live their lives. But if you have children together, uh, even though you're not a unit, you will see each other, you will correspond, um, you know, and think about the bonds if you've been married for a long time that, that people have created over the years. It's not like you walk out of a courtroom and that disappears. Right. Now you're also trained in collaborative law and mediation. I did collaborative law. Um, I wish would have taken off here more than it did. And it seems like about 10 years ago, there was a huge push for that. And yes, I did get training in that and I am trained to mediate as well, which I hope again um, is really really gets legs here with the courts refer cases to mediation more than they ever have which is not a bad thing because it gives the parties the ability to control the outcome of their own lives when you walk into a courtroom you know people want their day in court they want notice and an opportunity to be heard they want you to hear them when they want the court to hear them and the reality is not television the reality is you might get five or ten minutes that is entirely scripted. Your lawyer will have spent time with you, your lawyer will tell you pretty much exactly what to say, and it, it, it's not TV. Gotcha. So, under no-fault divorce, what must be alleged, approved, in order to obtain a divorce? You don't have to prove really much. You do a bare-bones <coughs> petition for dissolution of marriage or for separation. It's jurisdictional. It's where the parties live. Have you lived here for six months? Um, you have to meet the residency requirement. And then there is actually something called proof at the end of the case, and that's jurisdictional as well. So what's alleged in the petition for dissolution, the court picks up in the proof interrogatories before the court enters a decree to ensure that, again, you've met the residency requirements, that the um, female party is not pregnant um, because the court won't enter a divorce if a party's pregnant unless that a uh, putative father comes in and, and testifies that he is actually the father and the husband isn't, which I've had happen back in my early days, mm. which was quite a surprise. Mm. Um, so you need to know a little bit of the ins and outs. That's one example of, of knowing what you're in for before you walk in the courtroom. So, so the, the, the basic situation is the marriage is, and the, the magic word is, irretrievably broken? An irretrievable breakdown. and. What is interesting is that only one party has to say that the marriage is broken, and the other party says, well, what if I don't agree? And the answer is, I'm sorry, that's not what the law is. The law is it takes one party to say it's over, and then it's over. So one spouse cannot successfully prevent the other from obtaining They can divorce. try really hard, though. <laughs> make it incredibly long and incredibly expensive. And those are really tough cases because the one, the one party wants, wants finality, um, and the other party just says, I'm, I'm not ready for this, and eventually come around. And those, those are hard cases to mediate, too. But I, I think that um, a, a well-trained mediator could get someone, try to get someone at least to an agreement. Interesting. Well, we've talked about the, the change from fault to no-fault divorce. Another sea change I'd like to mention is the advent of family courts. Can you explain how family courts um, have evolved and have become equipped to handle dissolution of marriage and its attendant issues? Yes, I can. When I first started to practice, I would appear over at the Hall of Justice, which is the 600 West Jefferson Building, right. before it was redone and before the Judicial Center came about. Um, Judge Fitzgerald, Richard Fitzgerald at that time within Family Court 9, who I had the um, great um, privilege of being in front of for who my, very first, lost. For my yes. very first family law case, um, and what a loss to the you know an, mm -hmm. entire bar and to mm -hmm. the social work um, school as well. Mm -hmm. um, the family court is a one court, one family system, which he was um, an architect of. I think along with Ellen Ewing, and there's one more person who, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think Richard name. Gravel was the first family court judge in Jefferson County. Yes, so every time a family appears in family court, it should be the same judge. You should appear before the same judge that gives some history and background. Um, and I think some people don't like that because they would rather have a different judge because they're stuck with somebody that really does know what's going on in their case mm -hmm. to, to our advantage as attorneys and to the party that is probably acting in the better capacity to, to their advantage too, but maybe sometimes not the one who's the, who's the troublemaker, we'll say. So, so family court itself, um, I think around the time, I think it was 97 when, um, when the case came out that established family court 
that is a hybrid between district and circuit court. But recently, I saw something that said it's it's actually they, they've got circuit court capacity. Period. That's right. That's right. So, and and that's interesting on its own because the evidentiary standards and the burdens of proof, mm -hmm. um, and for appellate purposes, um, I can't imagine honestly having any other kind of family court system that we would we would have merged with with anything else. I mean, we we not only need what we have, but we could get a couple more judges. Right. We need some money for the budget. <laughs> we could get a couple more judges. It wouldn't be a bad thing. And I will say that the LBA played a role uh, back in 2002 in helping pass a constitutional amendment that made family courts a permanent part Excellent. of our um, judicial system. Excellent. And now Kentucky's family courts are somewhat of a national model. And I think Jefferson County specifically is um, stands out in the the field, not just here, but I think nationally for several different projects and then of course they just opened um, the dependency court for the first right. time so if you walk over there you'll see signs that say these proceedings are now open it's going to be very interesting right right that's It'll been be somewhat of a push for a number of years and this is a yes. pilot project yes in jefferson county as well but the family court started out as the pilot project too so that's right and look how that turned out right right well let's get into the meat of it um can you just tell us in a divorce proceeding or, or dissolution of marriage, what are some of the main issues that the court must determine? Um, I assume division of property, um, uh, child custody, support, that sort of thing? Well, of course you might have a divorce where the parties don't have any children, which um, practitioners love because technically it should be a little bit easier just because at least you don't have the kids part that you have to make a determination the court has to make a determination about and remember Scott too at any moment these parties can make an agreement they don't have to be in the court system I have plenty of cases where my clients have never seen the light of court some mm. practitioners might not appreciate that as much as others but for for my purposes uh, if, the, if I can provide ease and comfort, and I think that's one of those ease and comfort things for clients, yeah. they love not going to court. Sure. I mean, I, I operate from the, if you don't have to, why would you? Because again, it, it's that control that, right. you, that you cede entirely to a court, which in Jefferson County is one person. You are giving one person who's a judge and may not have sat on that bench for very long or maybe there forever, but you're getting one person um, the decision making over your entire life. So the that the petition itself says um, in, the, in the demand and the prayer for relief that you want a dissolution, dissolution of your marriage, that you want joint or sole custody and, and putting sole custody in petitions anymore. It's, it's, it's just kind of silly. Nobody even really does it. Okay. Um, ask for joint custody um, for, for parenting time. You know, that the evolution, which uh, you had asked about of even that prayer for relief mm -hmm. is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a sea change in that because it used to be liberal parenting time, you know, joint custody with liberal parenting time. Then we moved to joint primary residential and then a residential custodian and sort of these terms of art for lawyers, which we've had to keep up with over the last 20 years as, as this has evolved. So now it's joint custody. Um, mm -hmm. Then the parenting schedule is what drives most everything. What's the parenting time going to be? Uh, I think everybody asks for equal parenting time anymore. And then after that, you get to child support under the Kentucky guidelines. If you have children, um, you may add in spousal support, a request for spousal support, whether temporary or permanent, a division of marital property, a restoration of non-marital property, mm -hmm. and an assignment of debt, because the debt, if you ever look at our statutory scheme, never even figures in. It, it's just part of the property, and Nidlinger versus Nidlinger, I think, is still the, the case that says that the court's going to as, as, assign the debt uh, according to how the debt was used in the marriage for the most part, or accumulated during the marriage. <clears throat> With regard to child support, you mentioned some Kentucky guidelines. Um, elaborate on that a little bit for me. Um, there is the Uniform Child Support Act, which Kentucky adopted, and for parties who, again, choose because you can contract to not pay child support, to waive it for, for whatever reason. Um, in certain circumstances, and I'll, I'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. But the guidelines um, are, they presume about 76% of the time with the custodial parent, and about 24% of the time with the non-custodial parent, which again ha has shifted, but the mm -hmm. names have remained the same because the custodial, non-custodial parent throws parties off in the first place, and, and hopefully we'll get to the point where that changes a little bit too on the forms. 
but the calculation itself looks at gross income. We are um, a gross income child support calculation state where we put the two parties' incomes in and the rest of the sheet gets down. Uh, you input what the, um, how many children there are and the guidelines presume an amount, presume an amount of monthly child support to be paid from that non-custodial to the custodial parent, which again is not even um, necessarily the time share. So if the time share is greater than the 76% and 24%, we at one time had a calculation where you could figure out the deviation, which is a mathematical calculation, where you could figure out the deviation so that it took into account that when one party's time increased and the other party's time decreased, that the party paying the child support, that their amount decreased um, along with the amount of time. So what we don't like to talk about is days for dollars, trading, trading kids and time for dollars, but at the same time, without amending the statute or without amending the guidelines, you had to account for time spent with the child. At, at some point, somebody went, why am I paying this money? Because I see this child this amount of time. Mm -hmm. So many deviations to the child support guidelines were created. And again, you can waive the guidelines. Mm -hmm. You can come to whatever amount of child support you choose to pay. Okay. Uh, but the deviation is in place if you, if you can't make an agreement. And then the court has very wide discretion about how the court will make the deviation, either for the time or there, there is a number or a number of factors in the statute that the court will look at. So, so the guidelines are statutory creatures? The guidelines are statutory. Um, I think they're a default. They're certainly, if you go into a child support case, it's certainly what the county attorney uses. Anytime you make a motion for temporary support or for permanent support, you have to walk in with a child support calculation, which some get from Craig Ross, the computer program that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, that anybody can put on their computer that's a practitioner, which we suggest. However, the court should not rubber stamp those. Okay. So for the benefit of our viewers, um, these guidelines will be found in the Kentucky Revised Statutes. Is it Chapter 403? It's 403-210 at Sequitur. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, um, you mentioned a little bit um, something that piqued my interest about um, putting in the party's gross income. Right. And, and so t tell me a little bit about um, the discovery process, for lack of a better term, uh, and the, the truth-finding process about parties' incomes, because I assume that plays a role in the division of marital property as well. Wow, <laughs> there's a lot that that there uh, there's a lot that goes on there. Mm -hmm. The statutes define gross income. That's especially important to know because if you want to know what gross income is, what's included, what your gifts, then mm -hmm. you need to look at the statute. Uh, also, very important is if someone's self-employed. There's, an, there's a, a, another paragraph where it's the self-employed. Um, if you're self-employed, if you run on a cash basis, I think one of the most oft heard comments to me from some clients is, you know, he gets paid in cash or she gets paid in cash. How am I going to find it? You know, either is the rub. And it depends on how much money you want to spend always because mm -hmm. you could get a private investigator, you can <clears throat> subpoena incredible amounts of records. Um, yeah, I think it costs, I think the banks charge now to even do printouts that are a look back for people's income. So the uh, probably most common forms of proof of income are a tax return, mm -hmm. 1099, a W-2, um, any, and, and this, is, this is a trick, I'm gonna give a trick away. Okay. Financial statements of spouses or parents will often claim income that one might not claim in court, may often claim a higher amount of income earned in order to qualify for a loan, qualify for a new business, hmm. and then the income that they come in with in court does not state the same amount, which is always fun to get if you can get a financial statement. They're not that common, but if you can get one, you know, there, there are little tricks of the trade, I think, to, to compare what somebody says they earn and what they actually earn. So I suspect, with particularly with clients of substantial wealth, right. that this could be a particularly contentious area of time well, practice? Well, very much so, but the clients of, of substantial wealth will not be in the guidelines because the guidelines top out at $15,000 mm. per month that's combined gross income. So if, mm. if you already have that level of income, the child support calculation 
going back to what we talked about with the deviation, one of the deviations from the child support guidelines is a high income earner, high income parent, high income family. So the proverbial NBA stars um, or the, the athletes, movie stars, anything like that. And we've had some sports star cases here that, that aren't too old. We'll look at the actual needs of the child. That's what, and then there's a, there's a rule about how many ponies one can have, and one should only ever have two or three ponies. God, I can't remember if it's two or three, but it's two or three. Two is enough, apparently. Um, and then there becomes an issue about a windfall to the parent that is caring for the child who has a child with the person with the especially high income. So does the child support go actually to the child or does it go to the parent? And if I'm the high income earner, I'm going to pay for my child, but I don't want the largesse to go to the other parent because that's not what child support's for. Gotcha. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about child support, and I know we're going to talk a lot right. more about that. I wanted to uh, talk about, in terms of um, evolution, in terms of art, the old term that I'm familiar with in terms of um, spousal support would be alimony. Is right. that sort of an outdated term? or, or what? What's no, the... I think some people still use it. Mm -hmm. I think people use it. I think people use spousal support, and I think they use maintenance, and they all mean exactly the same thing. Okay. Nothing is, is any different. Um, it's an interesting topic for my personal opinion is that we're going to see less and less of it, which I had even before the tax change. So the tax change now is that up until December 31st, 2018, from the way that I understand it, you can deduct maintenance payments if you're the maintenance obligor, mm. Mm. and they're still taxable to the maintenance obligee. Okay. But after December 31st, 2018, those rules no longer apply which for me, I'm trying to figure out how in the world we're supposed to get our clients to agree to pay maintenance, not through court order. Mm -hmm. Because again, my goal is to keep people out of court if I can, because <clears throat> I think they have more, they retain more control over their own lives that way. So the um, incentive, let's say, for the payors um, is, is not great. They're, they're, why would you do that? But how can I ever talk you into doing that if you're not gonna get a tax deduction, but you're gonna pay $4,500 a month? I mean, I think it's a really tough sell, and I think that the, the, the creators of the tax provision did not do us any favors in family law. Okay. Now, you've been at this quite a while, so I wondered if you have seen a change over the years in, the, in terms of um, spousal support orders as women have gained more um, economic power. That is incredibly interesting because that's the assumption that women have gained more economic power, and they have, but that doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate to income. Um, and I think that there is an assumption too that certain judges will uh, make certain orders because they're judges. They sit on the bench, obviously, they're very well educated, um, know what it's like to, to work a, a, not just a nine to five, but be on call sort of a job. Um, and there are cases where the, one of the parents doesn't work. Um, there are cases where one of the parents is ill. Um, those are straightforward maintenance cases. That's what spousal support is for. And re remember, there's re rehabilitative maintenance too. So back in the olden days, maybe the wife would give up her degree. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to be sexist, that's a bit, but, but you that's, know, the that's, the way, that's the way it worked mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. um, wife met husband in college. Uh, she was a junior in college. She had a year left on her degree, got pregnant. They got married. She didn't finish her degree. A, a year away from it. Let's flash forward 15 years. Mm -hmm. She says, oh my goodness, these kids are about to leave the nest. I've got three or four more years with my with my youngest. Um, I'm gonna go back to school. They're gonna get a divorce in the interim. Um, her skills, while fantastically wonderful because she's a homemaker, she's raised the children, and no, never denigrate that in, in front of a court, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, She's got these incredible skills, very intelligent person, but she's been on the job market. And she's probably 40, let's say, um, mm. which doesn't help matters any when you're trying to get a job, because let's face it, young people you know, own the world. Uh, I accept that, Scott. <laughs> um, so that's the point of rehabilitative maintenance. If, if, if the other spouse has the, the earnings, um, if there's not sufficient property in the marriage for her to just pay for school, go get a degree, then should she, be compensated basically for the years as a homemaker of that contribution should she be compensated if perhaps her spouse she did stay home he did get his degree he has you know earns a half a million dollars a year should he pay her to go to school so that she can get on with her life and, and make some money 
because that's what she wants to do, not because she's necessarily death threat, because she's made a choice. And um, th those cases are very, very few and very, very far between these days. And I know there was a trend toward boomer divorce, um, but in boomer divorces, some of those people have already been married once. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's less money to go around and, mm -hmm. and that's always, maintenance isn't just because one person qualifies for it. There are the laundry list of factors that you look at for spouse support. And one of them, huge one, is the other party's ability to pay. So, but the two big ones are um, the, is there sufficient property, which can be money that that spouse is gonna get and can that spouse meet his or her monthly expenses? And the court has to answer those two and can't default to a computer program to answer those questions. I, I wanted to ask you, I know we have already established that fault is not a, a factor anymore right. in granting of a divorce, but right. does fault play any role in determining spousal support? I don't think so. In, in my experience, it mm -hmm. doesn't. There's there's nothing in the statute that mentions any kind of adultery as, as far as maintenance. Mm -hmm. I, I've never seen that happen. I, I think people want that to be true. I was going to say, right. that probably gets back to right. what you were alluding to earlier right. about people wanting to extract the pound of flesh right. because of the unfaithful right. partner. Right. Mm -hmm. In those cases, the, the cases that have um, revenge at their core, um, they're hard. I mean, they're mm -hmm. hard for everybody. and. It, I'm going to I'm going to do my counseling if if you mm -hmm. can get your clients into counseling even the shortest shortest term and even delay the divorce proceedings for some counseling to occur and mm -hmm. I mean more than the families in transition program mm -hmm. and I don't mean counseling to determine whether you're going to get a divorce or not because I think there was a stat a, a bill pending as a legislature that they wanted a waiting period that's not what I'm talking about right. I'm talking about counseling that can be simultaneous to the divorce proceeding for clients to get their their heads completely and utterly straight for the kind of clarity that clients need for this process because they need a lot of clarity. Mm -hmm. Again, we go back to what are we talking about? We're talking about money, and we're talking about your children. Right. Two of the hugest things that people will ever have to deal with in their futures right. on top of everything else. Right. So boy, and that was the part of, of the collaborative training was um, to work with a financial advisor and to work with potentially um, healthcare providers and mental health treatment providers who were also trained to work along with lawyers so that you got your case done. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was referencing earlier when I talked about having to assume more than just a strict um, attorney's role. You have to actually kind of help people through this process. And in your case, oh, referring absolutely. people to counseling, that's a good that's a good. Well, and, and you know, the, the great thing is being steeped in this for as long as I have and being here in Louisville, that I can make a, a, a phone call in three seconds and usually get somebody on the line and make a, a really solid referral mm -hmm. for somebody that I've worked with before mm -hmm. and that I know is, is golden and will do my client right. Let's talk a little bit about um, the child custody determination. So we've wow. got um, a married couple with children, minor children, I right. assume, because once they've reached adulthood, we're not worried about right. custody. So I guess let's just delve into that. What are some of the considerations that a court must um, take into to consideration in determining child custody? For determination of custody, the custody statute um, it is KRS 403.270 has not been altered that much that, that I know of since I've practiced, not, not really much at all. There are a laundry list of factors the court looks at to determine custody in the best interests of the children, which is the lodestar and always has been for determining what's best for kids. Um, and again, recently we shifted more to what parenting time, what the parenting schedule is going to be and away from custody because recently there is a statute that in an original custody proceeding allows for one party to say, I want equal time and I want uh, joint custody straight, straight out of the door, which we used to file motions for that anyway, but now there's a presumption that that should happen. Um, but the court is always gonna get kicked back to care of us for 3270. And if you choose to do this work um, you need to know that statute upside down, backwards and forwards. Um, and really, for my purposes, I've seen motions get um, a little bit lazier and lazier. Um, and when I first started to practice, boy, you had to make your custody case. I mean, you really, that was the chance you had to tell your client's story, to uh, correlate it with the, um, with the custody, the laundry list of factors. Um, 
It is the wishes of the child to his or her custodian, the wishes to the parent as to custody, mental health of the parties, it's domestic violence a factor, mm. it's physical health of the parties. Um, you know, we even look at whether parties smoke or don't, drug use, alcohol use, mm -hmm. um, the um, interrelationship of the children with other relatives. Um, and I think those are, are the high points. And I know when my clients come in, it's generally um, a safety issue for, for custody purposes if they want sole custody particularly. And what I tell them now is unless there is a mental illness that's untreatable, and there are mental illnesses that are untreatable. And I actually had a case where um, a young man came in who was in um, his jail attire, we'll say, and he was in jail not because he was a criminal necessarily, but he had auditory hallucinations. And um, that was indicative, because he had one right then and there during the hearing, that my client should have sole custody. So that was sort of a gimme. Doesn't really happen, but mm -hmm. in those cases, um, there are people who will be incarcerated um, for such a great length of time that joint custody is nonsensical. It's just not going to happen. Um, I think domestic violence is a huge factor um, in custody decisions. And what's interesting for me is how do you have joint custody if you can't speak to each other? Um, I think that's going to be and is a tough one for the courts if you really can't communicate. Is that in the best interest of the child? which back in the day um, the courts looked at the ability of parents to cooperate i mean that was one of the big factors for joint custody mm -hmm. like do can can these parents get along well enough that the children will will fare best with both of them court didn't really do that anymore um and i'm not sure how that gap kind of happened because mm -hmm. i still think the parents ability to cooperate is huge um there are parenting apps I know Google Calendar is huge. Uh, people can get online to check kids' schooling. But if the parties can't even speak to one another, I mean, can't speak, actually cannot speak to one another, how do you parent? Which takes me to one of my stories. Um, and I can't remember if I saw it online or in another lawyer's office that had been practicing forever and ever. But it, it a, a girl grew up and she said her idea of um, joint custody was being exchanged and holidays, her idea of joint custody and holidays were being exchanged on a highway in the snow, opening one parent's car door to get into the other parent's car door and nobody spoke to the other person. Mm -hmm. And that's the generation, you know, that we've raised through these, these statutes. And again, why I say, if you can stay out of the, out of the courtroom, why wouldn't you? So mediation and collaborative law again. Absolutely. And counseling and, and you know, learning how to cooperate with each other. And, and, you know, parenting coordinators are great as far as they go. And if it works, it's fantastic. And I don't want to necessarily require clients to do more work. But if you have ch children, you kind of have to do that work. Right. So you've cited a couple of examples where it was pretty clear cut that, you know, sole custody right. would be the outcome. Right. I imagine in the majority of the cases, it's much more nuanced. And so let's talk a little bit about the role of third party advisors, if you right. will, to the court right. in terms of helping the court make these custody determinations. So like mental health examinations or other evaluations of, of one parent or the other. Um, I remember when those started to happen and um, psychological evaluations are still ordered fairly frequently. Um, if there is a real issue, um, that isn't clear cut and the parties can afford it because we're talking $3,000 a piece just walking into the door mm -hmm. for a custodial evaluation. Um, if they can afford it, um, I don't think it's a bad idea, but again, if one person who is the psychological evaluator and that one person's opinion, and then you got one person who's the court and that person's opinion, mm -hmm. so you're still working on two people's opinions. Um, however, it's helpful and the court is absolutely um, allowed by the statutes to um, have experts to help the court decide when the court is, is, is faced with um, And the parties have to bear that expense? Yeah, they absolutely have to bear that expense. Okay. And that's, you know, that's when disparity of income comes into play because mm -hmm. that comes into play with all divorces um, mm -hmm. if, if it is in fact a factor. Mm -hmm. In addition to custodial evaluators, um, there are um, parenting coordinators. You can refer to parenting coordinators. There's counseling. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, therapeutic parenting. 
there um, are friends of the court and guardians ad litem who are attorneys just for the children and right. how they make reports and whether they can testify. Um, there was just a, a case a couple of years ago that defined those rules specifically, and that's too much to get into now. But mm -hmm. there's, they're, they're attorneys for actually for the child. Okay. Um, so these are all the people that the court, all the experts that the court can defer to. But again, I think this is really important. That court is the final decision maker and cannot abdicate its decision to any of these experts. In, in your experience, how much deference do courts, and Huge. by that I mean judges, Huge. give to these uh, third party experts? Absolutely tons. And, and, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that by any means because mm -hmm. these are professional people, but at the same time, the court is the entity that's in the best position to have all these people to judge their credibility and the other people won't necessarily it, once you get to the point of court and you have to talk about evidence as well um, and the court's in the best position to and uh, the only position to determine whether evidence is admissible whether it's relevant and and the meaning of these reports and and, and the court may determine that it's not very helpful that could be the other part um, mm -hmm. it's just not very helpful and the parties have the ability after an evaluation is, is made to um, say what they think the recommendations should be if they're not exactly what they like and if it's unfavorable to one of the parties that attorney really better get busy and start cleaning that thing up before it potentially becomes a, a record or an yeah. order of the court it's okay. huge it's one of the one of the greatest things that i think lawyers who have these cases and get um, evaluation to get the reports back and the same holds true for friends of the court and guardian ad litem. You really need to read those very closely before they get to the court and become part of the evidence. Okay. One question I had, and this may um, harken back to the historical perspective that we started with, um, domestic relations commissioners, are they still used in Jefferson County? Not here. Okay, but they are out in the state? As far as I know, and in mm -hmm. fact, when I did my mediation training, um, one of the, the, it was with some law students as well, and one of the, the students mentioned the use of a domestic relations commissioner in the county that the person was in. For the benefit of our viewers, can you just kind of give us a, a, an overview of what a domestic relations commissioner is and what they, they do? They have authority to make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of an offshoot, I guess, of the court. Um, we used to have them over at the Jefferson County uh, Law Library, old jail building, mm -hmm. and you would report as if you were at a hearing. Mm -hmm. You got ready for your hearing, you did the same prep that you would do to appear in court. They could divorce parties, I mean, they could listen to the proof. Mm -hmm. um, they made child support decisions. Um, and I, I think, which I have not thought about before, but it seems that mediation has now taken over the role of what domestic relations commissioners used to do, and mm -hmm. I haven't thought about that until right now. So. Okay, interesting. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, in terms of the, the child's input into the custody decision, does Kentucky have an age at which a child can express his or her wishes about which parent they want to uh, reside with? Absolutely not. Um, I think that's one of the greatest myths of family law um, mm -hmm. because people it's usually 14 for some reason. People mm -hmm. think it's 14. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I've sure. Heard that, I'm yeah. not sure why. I have no idea why. It's not in there. Not in any of the statutes. What is in the statutes is the child's wish as to his or her custody. That's one of the factors under KRS 43-270. Mm -hmm. um, but getting the child's wish and the child's wishes as to his or her custody into a motion for the court, mm -hmm. first is it hearsay. Who said it? Are you asking your client or your child, who do you want to live with? Who do you mm -hmm. want to be with? What did mommy say? What did daddy say? What did you do when you were at daddy's? Mm -hmm. um, I am always especially hesitant to, um, if that's not coming from a, a different source that is probably one of those experts, best way to do that is, is through a therapist. It's, it's for the child's therapist to say, if the therapist is willing to do that, that he or she thinks the child will, will fare better with one or the other so rare sometimes happens um what's also interesting here is court uh interviews with children i was going to ask about that whether, whether that's a thing it is in other states um here the court can do it i have not been very successful with it um i love the idea of mature children um uh, being able to and, and there are some who are in incredibly articulate, even at 12, mm -hmm. um, even at 11, really, incredibly articulate. I don't want to be with this person because I don't like this person. 
period. I mean, I have had children in cases that I don't like this other parent. I don't want to live with this person and here's why. And it's, it's very convincing. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's not to seemingly get an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, it's not because one party has, you know, alienated the child. It's, it's a very articulate, very mature, well-regulated child that says, please don't make me do this. Um, and those are hard because the courts don't have to interview the kids. I want them to in mm -hmm. those situations, mm -hmm. but I've had other situations where a court has done it and then a child inevitably says something that neither attorney's ever heard. Um, mm -hmm. That what more often than not happens is the children are telling the parents the same thing. Um, I love you, I want to be with you. I love you, I want to be with you. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, boys, even if they want to be with dads, will absolutely not say it because they don't want to hurt their mother's feelings. Mm -hmm. um, their boys, uh, in my experience, have been so protective of their mothers. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, even though I'm not a psychologist, boy, do you have to delve into, into some of these. And I've had to make my own phone calls to professionals just to say, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a domestic violence case where the, the, it was a child that was interviewed by the court and my client got custody after the interview based on the child's breakdown and telling the absolute truth um, that we didn't know was quite what it was. So you don't know what's going to happen. They're entirely unpredictable. You've got to have a really great hold of the case and ensure if you can that the child's not just trying to gain advantage um you know that he wants to be with mom because mom's going to take him on vacation or has all the money or, or whatever it might be right, right or no rules at moms versus dads right so in those uh, circumstances in which a judge does interview a child about uh, their their preferences does that take place privately or in the presence of the parties absolutely not in the presence of the parties you can ask for it to pop up on the closed circuit televisions that are inside the courtroom mm -hmm. yay technology mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it's better than they even used to be the court will take the child back um, generally with the lawyers with a list of, of questions um, I have seen there was one particular judge that was just a master um, at putting the child at ease so that they, and the judge's offices aren't these, you know, formalized. They're usually pretty, pretty casual offices mm -hmm. and they sit the child down and ask about school and, and sort of do a lead in um, and then get to, get to the, the meat, mm -hmm. get to the marrow of it. Um, I wish they would do it more, frankly, mm -hmm. for, the, for the more mature children. I, I think that a lot of kids would like to be heard in these cases. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them would like to be heard. Um, you know, we have really complex family relationships now, so I wanted to ask a little bit about like the, the rights, if any, of step parents in custody determinations, whether they may not be the biological parent, right. but they've had a long relationship with the child and still want to be a part of the child's life. Is, is there a difference where there's not a biological connection with uh, the child? You know, that's interesting, and I think that has also evolved. Um, for step parents, should the parties, not they're not even parties, should a party be married and that party that's the parent, who's the parent, divorce the spouse. The spouse who is the step parent has no rights, period, done. Unless the step parent adoption would somehow occur, mm -hmm. which it can't because the other party's alive and present, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's no rights. So you can cut the connection off immediately, right then and there. Now, whether they choose to continue the bond or not because they are so bonded, um, they can do that on their own time, but it's not going to happen at court. Um, what I have seen the courts do at the beginning of my practice, it was forget about it. You have no say, um, new spouse, new other parent, not other parent, new spouse. You have no say because um, you're not the parent. And over time, I have seen courts try to account for other family relationships. Um, not control, they, they, no decision making, but certainly take them into account. The interesting part is when um, the children's schedules, um, yeah, yeah, people that are married to each other, they get divorced, they marry other people, mm -hmm. all the kids, a bunch of the kids, mm -hmm. and there's a split schedule between the parents and one of the parents inevitably wants 
the kids from the first marriage to have the same schedule as the kids with the second marriage and can cause all kinds of friction. And it's usually when relationships change, there, there's some flux. There's some flux when one party remarries or one party moves in with somebody and they have children. Um, and then I think there's some, is this person trying to make a family that's not the family, you know, with, with my kids, with their, and it, it gets a little strange. Um, I'm not a fan of spouses trying to make decisions um, for the kids of my clients. So I try to cut them out. I'll be honest about it because at the end of the day, should those parties divorce, mm -hmm. which, what did you open with, Scott? Right. What and are the stats are? The higher rate of divorce among subsequent marriages. Those are the stats, right? Mm -hmm. So if those parties divorce and this person has been given, you know, some kind of dis discretion even or control over mm -hmm. what happens to my client's kids, mm -hmm. then what happens? You know, and I, I it's too messy. Too messy. Right. Let's keep it clean. So how, how much into the details do courts get in terms of setting parenting schedules? Oh, if the parties entirely, can't agree. entirely. Okay. That's it. That's what we do now. Okay. That's absolutely, uh, we talked about custody. It's not about that anymore. It's not about a custody determination. Mm -hmm. Let's just walk in with joint custody. Let's think about, we're walking in with joint custody. Then what's the parenting schedule going to be? So what that great determinant is now is just a party's work schedule. Mm. Um, really, I mean, mm -hmm. and the first shift, second shift, third shift, are you on salary? How much do you travel? Um, are you in the, in the country, out of the country? Are you in state? Are you in town? What's fascinating to me is the fights that occur over where the child's going to spend the night and that the child is asleep. Um, I still don't get it, but some people, I've had clients come in with, um, notebooks and graphs and charts about the actual hours that they have i mean down to minutes wow. these are the hours that i have and i want these are the hours that i have and i want these are the hours that are available these are hours that aren't available um it's really interesting um they're well prepared i don't know how how well it really plays with the court i don't think we haven't talked about fitness and we haven't talked about fit parents and back in the sole custody days, fitness of a parent was huge. We litigated the fitness of a parent mm -hmm. all the time. We don't really do that now. Okay. Um, unless there are the issues that I talked about before. Right. Um, fitness, it's presumed that both parties are fit and it's presumed that they can both parent. So how are you going to get a schedule? Right. And if you know as a party coming into a case, because you probably do, you read the papers, um, you read the internet, you've seen cases, your your friends, cousins, sisters, uncle got this in his case, so you should get this in your case. So right. they know about half time. Mm -hmm. People are coming in that know about half time. You know, and the interesting thing is gonna be where this goes mm -hmm. and if it goes back to the pendulum swing back or if, the, or if we go a little bit further before the pendulum swings back, before we get back in the middle, I don't know. You know, and the other part of this is, is we have raised a generation, because if you think about this, in 1997, when I started doing this, these kids are 20. And then if they started with these schedules back then, these kids are, you know, teenagers now, late teenagers, mm -hmm. 20s, mm -hmm. they're going to form their own relationships. Mm -hmm. And how are they going to parent? Right. And, and I think that the, the, the ramifications of, uh, you know, because they're it, it, as much as great as the law is when it comes to making determinations about families these people are guinea pigs i mean not not purposely but that's really what it is when when you start a, a new part of the law and you start changing from sole custody shift from sole custody into joint custody and you start these parenting arrangements that were every other weekend then they were every other weekend overnight and then they were okay one night a week and every other weekend and then two nights a week and every other weekend and then a three four schedule and then a five two schedule and then a week on week off schedule and all of these um these different um arrangements that the courts have basically created and and with you know they go to judicial college there's psychological input into all this but when i started it was about meaningful time that a parent dad I mean, there's no reason to bend word, mm -hmm. parent, dad, mm -hmm. if he had the child um, on, on a meaningful basis, enough for them to form a bond, especially in the early years of the child's life, then that was sufficient. Completely the opposite now. 
completely the opposite now. What changed? Mm -hmm. You know, did we, did the law catch up? Did we force the law? I mean, what what changed there? Right. And so a meaningful bond now is a lot different than a meaningful bond was then. And I, I remember one judge in particular coming in with, with new statistics. You know, well, this, this time is what the meaningful time is for this father, and this is what I'm going to give, and it's just a totally different world out there now. So let's say a court has determined um, a visitation schedule. If you, the parties have either agreed to it or the court has had to, to set it, but then it's not working out so well. Right. What remedies does the, um, the aggrieved spouse have if the, the other spouse didn't deliver the child at the appointed time. And is, is that a large component of the post-decree practice? Oh, it's huge. Going back to court to... Well, and mediation and collaborative law. I'm going to take you back to that quickly because, first of all, mediation is not um, arbitration, number one. People need to know that. Arbitration is when you go to an individual and that individual makes the decision for you, which is basically court. Right. So you're just not in a courtroom. Right. Basically court. Mediation, the parties come to their own decision. Parties can choose to mediate, never see a courtroom, and then choose to mediate again. Don't have to see a courtroom, don't have to file a motion. You can say, I want to mediate this issue. More than likely, a counsel is going to file a motion to modify the schedule. Um, and again, Scott, anytime I go into court, I have to have, I have to meet the statutory criteria before I walk in the door. So if I'm going to modify a parenting agreement, why am I modifying it? Does it make sense? Am I doing it just to indulge my client, which I'm never going to do if they're going to lose? Why would I do that? I'm a straight shooter about what I think the chances are when they go into court. Mm -hmm. And if I think they're going to lose, I'm not going to take the case. Why would I do that? I think it's just silly, you know, and, and it's, it's more emotionally draining for the client. So if you're going to modify a schedule, it has to be that it doesn't work and not that it doesn't work for you. It has to be that it doesn't work for the child. And what can you show me to show me that this isn't working for this kid? Is a kid anxious? Most kids are anxious. So what's, what is the different anxiety than it was before? How is the anxiety amped up? Or, mm -hmm. you know, is the, is the child wetting the bed? Is the child having nightmares? Um, something big, something large enough in the child's life and the child's psychology and something that would make the court change the parenting schedule. One of the big ones would be if one of the parents is going to move. You would go to court. There's a relocation form that's in the um, AOC forms that one has to fill out now, um, and that, that's a change in the law too, because it used to be it just went back to the WIC, and now you actually have to fill out a form, you need a motion to relocate, um, you have to prove it's in the best interest of the child to relocate if the other parent objects. So that's a huge modification of a parenting agreement, and that could be a case that you actually go to court, um, along with what school is the child gonna attend, huge, that people can't agree on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the courts, of course, can't order private school, um, but the parties can talk about that during mediation as well. But you have to meet the statutory criteria if you're going to modify a parenting schedule. And I'm not doing it for the parents. I'm not doing it because somebody got married. I'm not doing it because somebody if somebody has a different job. I might. Their work hours change dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, so there are reasons to do it that that are related to the parents' needs, but mostly it's going to be what's going on with the kid. Okay. Have you encountered situations where there's a, you know, a visitation schedule or a parenting time schedule in place, but then the parties just kind of relax into their own All groove? All the time, every day. Okay. And here's what I will say about that. People want to text everything. The best record of communication between parties, the best I can get them to do is if they actually do an agreed order in their case that's signed and dated and I can file it in their case with the court that sets their new schedule. The parties come to parties, have agreed to modify the terms of the parenting schedule. Here they are, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Judge signs off on it, file it, you have a new order. It doesn't happen much, as you can well imagine, mm -hmm. so give me an email. At least give me an email where both the parties say, this is our new schedule, this works for both of us, we're gonna do this for now. If we're gonna modify it again later, we'll do it, but we both agree, um, put a date on it, and I mean, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But usually what happens is they modify it on their own. I don't know about it. We go into court, the court says, so what schedule are you doing? And then they can't agree on the schedule that they are doing, and that's why they're there. Wow. Again, incredibly uh, complex. Um, it's, it's human life, day to day. It is, it, you know what, and that is one of the best characterizations I've heard. It, it really is, and it's fascinating. And mm -hmm. I, I get bored very easily. I'm one of those people, <laughs> and this is never boring. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is just never boring because humanity is just so rich. And these stories that, you know, I've had clients I've become close to, 
um, they're, they're human stories and they're just mm -hmm. so interesting and, and met some of the cutest kids and <laughs> you know the happy ones it, it's just happy mm -hmm. adoptions happy 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 um, you know some some of them are just wonderful outcomes and some of them that make me want to cry so well in the time we have remaining I'm gonna veer into that makes you want to cry territory right. and talk a little bit about the interplay between um, custody disputes and domestic violence or domestic violence as a factor well um, custody disputes and domestic violence is a factor um, the court will hear testimony of domestic violence likely there's a petition that's in the record that's been filed so the mm -hmm. court has a separate domestic violence case and um, again that's that one court one judge matter. absolutely that's the value of family court and when the parties if the parties choose to not actually have a domestic violence order entered because one of the parties might lose their job, which is more than likely the case because mm -hmm. they go into the NCIC, they go into the system as domestic violence perks, right? Mm -hmm. Gonna lose the job, nobody's gonna have any income, why would you do that? So we have the ability to do a um, no contact order because domestic violence is civil. And on my end, the family court end, there's the criminal court end, mm -hmm. and I can do that too, but this part's the civil part. Okay. So we can dismiss in the in the domestic violence case to enter an order a no contact order or whatever it's going to be in the family court case that's still punishable by contempt if that person's going to violate it hopefully they won't mm -hmm. and i don't think people are dismissed i don't think they're willing to do that hopefully not when there is um when there's been either sexual abuse or, or physical assault let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's hope that that's not the case um i don't know that those are necessarily that the worst cases i think the worst are parental alienation cases that's not a tort here. Um, I almost want it to be because they're just horrible and those are the ones where uh, you just can't get any relief. And uh, elaborate other, on that a little bit. What do you mean by parental alienation? Go back to Kramer versus Kramer and those old movies mm -hmm. and whenever you see a parent, it, it's like even Munchausen syndrome when, when mm -hmm. one parent physically poisons a child. That's what I like too is you psychologically poison a child against the other parent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and hopefully when the child is 18, they can reunite, And uh, but sometimes not, Scott. And it just, those just, they, it, they made my stomach hurt. I mean, and that's just, where that, that vengeance oh, motive comes horrific. in. Horrific. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I'm glad you said that. In our closing, we can talk about um, the um, ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. High conflict parenting is, is one of the top predictors of, of a poor outcome for your child. Um, I'd say alienation was right up there. And if you've got a mentally ill parent, which I think a parent who um, who does this, who alienates a child, I think there's mental illness there. Mm. Um, why would you do that? I mean, you're depriving your child of, of the other parent's love and attention. And as much as you hate them, you've got to get over it. You've got to get over it for the sake of the kid. And if I'm the judge, I will very likely change your custody. Very likely. I mean, if, if you see me sitting over at that bench and I get one of these cases and I think there's proof of it, I would very likely change custody. I think they're huge and I think they're incredibly harmful to children. And, and you know, I don't, I don't, the counseling part and the collaborative part mm -hmm. and the mediation part, mm -hmm. those are not effective for these cases. Mm -hmm. And the courts can continue to send us, but we're never going to get any results. So those are the sad ones. Wow. Wow. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here today, and I really appreciate you being with us. Um, you know, just to kind of wrap up, it sounds like that family law is not for everybody. It is not family for law is not for sissies. You, no, it's not. It's no, and you can't have a weak stomach. And and what I said at the beginning, you have to establish great boundaries. I might take a call at midnight. I might take a call at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, mm -hmm. these are situations that require. Some of them, I mean immediate attention. And a lot of my work is putting out fires on a regular basis and I have to do triage. I've always said I would be great in an ER because you have to determine what needs what the most at that very second. Gotcha. Um, it will be interesting for whoever does it. It'll be interesting, but it's an investment. It's an investment of time, it's an investment of money, energy, and you have to keep on the ball because it shifts so much. Even if the statute doesn't shift, boy, the, the, the way that the court looks at cases and the different ways that you can practice a case shift. So keeps me on my toes. Well, thanks. Thanks for being with us today. And thanks uh, to you for viewing. And our thanks to Jim Ray Consulting Services for helping produce this edition of the LBA Speaks.